and uh, it's all over the country just about that way, especially in the hill country. And uh, you can see the fence over at a distance with larger rocks, and that's typical also. And last week as we closed, or last, uh, whenever the last class was, as we closed, we were talking about the fact that Israel ran out of land uh, even in very shortly after they arrived in the land. And some of the ones complained they didn't have enough land. They wanted places with springs of water, different things of that sort. And uh, so there developed, uh, uh, well, at first they said, well, go clear the forest. And so they would do that. We see that in the Bible. And then we know from sources even till today that uh, they began to build terraces. And I showed you illustrations of how those terraces were built and uh, also uh, the fact that uh, there are still some of those around today. So I wanted to show you these couple of pictures of a place that is just outside Jerusalem. It is really along the, the Rephaim Valley, which is mentioned in the scripture. That valley is the one through which people like the Philistines came up to north of the city of Jerusalem and in battles with Saul, for example, and Jonathan, that battle in particular, that's the way they had come up to the city. So they traveled through the valleys, they traveled on the tops of the mountains, and those are the, uh, that's already determined, unless you perhaps at some point will be able to go along the coast. So this place is said to date back to around 1000 BC. It is called Sataf. And I have only made these pictures of it. I have not walked in it. I do hope to do that. And uh, it has been somewhat reconstructed. I don't mean the whole thing, but I mean it was in bad repair. And so they have taken portions of it at least, and they have restored it so that you would be able to see anyone can go. It's like a national park, so to speak. And you can go there and you can see. But you see terraces everywhere. And then you will occasionally, I'll come to another picture that will let you see some paths. There may be one just, uh, well, right along here. There's a path, you see that? Looks like a path there. And then go to this picture, which will give you a little better view of it, and you'll see there's a, perhaps a road that could be driven by a small vehicle and tractors and things of that sort. So there's a lot of rock in the, in the region, and then very clearly you can see the terraces as they go up. This is under a cloud shadow, I believe, and the other part is not. And this is on the way also, if you left out, from Jerusalem to the southwest. You're going south like you're going to the south part of the country and going down to the coast. And then if you made your turn after just a little while here to the left or more or less straight south, you would come to Bethlehem. So you're, you're north of Jerusalem, but you're going around the city and then to Bethlehem. And uh, that's a beautiful little illustration because they still utilize that and they actually do, you know, use the, the, uh, the plants and the fruit that is, that is there. Uh, okay, then I had mentioned this also earlier uh, from Isaiah chapter 5. I thought we may come to that again. How that uh, the Lord likened his people to a vineyard and they, of course, were not being uh, the people that had the vineyard and cared for it, weren't doing the proper thing and so on, and his punishment of the people. But do you notice in this vineyard, which has lots and lots of nice uh, vines and branches on them, and uh, you will see also a tower, like we had mentioned, the watchtower over on the left part of the picture, and that's typical also in many of the older areas of the city that of the country that we go to. Now, I'm going to tell you a few things about sowing and the sower, but this 
particular picture is made in northern Syria. This is the region that probably was hit by earthquake. Uh, this would be uh, like you were going to Antioch of Syria, but not quite that far. You're, you're a, good, a little distance from it, but not far from the border where the border with Turkey. And so you see land that has been prepared. I made this picture intentionally to show all of these things. Notice first on the left what we have here. I'll get the right one. There's a roadside. It's a modern roadside, paved. Here you see a field. You see trees that are in it. There are olive trees that are here. And they have prepared, the ground has rocks in it. And you will see also that it's been plowed, cultivated. And here are weeds that are growing. See that? So when they sow the seed, how do they sow it? They broadcast it like this. I do have one photograph. Maybe I have more, but I know of one I have that was made at uh, Lystra where a sower is doing this very thing, just like we used to do in the country. And so he just scatters the seed as he walks along like that. Some people, you know, have these little things like that that spread the seed. And so you could do it in either way. And uh, they do not, you do not see very often uh, the kind of drilling in the plants like we do here in this country to make rows and so on. But uh, some of the seed fell on the road as a result, and the birds would come and pick it up. Some of the seed would fall in that area where there are weeds that are growing, and so it wouldn't grow nearly as well. And some fell on rocky soil, probably not meaning, as I'm showing it here, but that underneath there is rock. And so there's a little bit of soil on top of that rock and there's not enough for it to get a uh, good root. And so therefore as a result it's going to uh, you know, not produce. And there's some among the thorns, obviously. Uh, didn't, wouldn't do too well there. But in this other place that's plowed, you do have often the olive grove or some other fruit and then there will be seed that will be planted there for wheat or barley. So you have all that growing in one place and uh, just a small farmer can do all of that you see at his one little place. And that's what I was making here. It's not a good photo but nonetheless it can illustrate what we're talking about. There's an old olive tree that's pretty much bent and that's at Samaria, just the ruins of ancient Samaria. You'll see a lot of rock on the side here. I'm standing on the roadway. And then over there you see areas within the field that he has plowed. And I actually have one picture where they're actually plowing the field. But he's right down below me and it, you know, I couldn't get it very good. But that, that's, it. that's what you read about in the Bible. That is exactly the story that we have told in Luke about the sower going forth to sow. And obviously the plants are going to do better where there is good soil than where there is not. Uh, agriculture, that's what we're dealing with, but we're continuing with other illustrations. This little picture from a source that is... Uh, identified there, the Illustrated Dictionary of Bible Times, says, shows everything that it takes to do the gathering of the grain and then the, the, the uh, oh, what do you call it, the running the sledge over it. And so I have all of these items that are mentioned identified. The first thing is the threshing. Now see, they have brought the grain in. They have cut the grain with a sieve like this. You know what I'm talking about? All right. And I have some pictures of that. Maybe at some time I can find those. Uh, I have millions of pictures. <laughs> Paulette will say, are you finished yet? I said, no, I found some more pictures that I would like to use. And so it is very difficult to 
uh, locate them sometimes because I don't remember what year. I have them identified by year, and I can't remember what year. Then, before 2000, the pictures, or around 30 years, the pictures are in slide format. And I don't use one of those unless I specifically remember it or I don't find what I need in digital format, so then I'll try to search for a slide like that, and then that's more difficult too, though they are identified by place. So you have a threshing, you have the process of threshing. The grain is bought, brought in. There is a little piece of wood about three to four feet long, about two feet wide, and that is run over the sled, over the grain, wheat or barley, by oxen or uh, donkeys are often used, and that's the threshing that takes place. Yes, the kids might be riding on that. They like to play too, and they help by putting some weight on that. And then you will see up here there is a winnowing that is taking place. There's a certain fork that has lots of space between the points of it. You throw that into the air, and the idea is the grain, the heavier, is going to fall down onto the threshing floor. You have to get a place that wind can reach it, and you want a time when it is windy so that this will be able to uh, provide uh, something to blow away the chaff from the grain. And so after the winnowing takes place, you're going to have to gather this into the uh, area, I'll pull it together, and then you will do the sifting. And sifting is going to use something that is round like this, just like a sifter that we used to see in the kitchens. And so you they take this and they sift this grain so that the grain falls through or stays in the sifter and the, the, uh, the idea is that the lightweight things will blow away and that would get rocks out and things of that sort as well which might be there. Then in addition, got to go back, I believe there's one more here, maybe not. All right, so there's the sifting, and I'll come to the winnowing in just a moment or two. Okay, so here we go. And I have some pictures. This is an old slide that was made in Lebanon, in the Bekaa Valley. And you see in this instance, I made this picture, so it's a real picture, not just some make-believe. And you will see that there's more than one person working. You can see a horse mule here, and then a mule behind him and he's riding on his sledge and the sledge is going around and around and around and they can just bring more of the grain down onto the threshing floor and go over that. And the purpose of that is to cut it into smaller pieces each time you go over it. So if you get it down to three inches, next time maybe you get it down to two and one or one and a half and one and a half if you're that good at this work. All right, so now here we have in the same area, you have the men who are, have already made some, some finished the project, and they have used bags here to fill them with the good grain. And that's why you sometimes get stuff in, in your bread. <laughs> you know, you get a piece of something like that in the bread for sure. And this one is from Egypt. This is from Luxor. And this gentleman is using the oxen uh, in order to do the threshing. And I believe he seems to be, is he riding on it? No, I don't think so. But he is uh, going around and around and around with the oxen and uh, trying to cut that into the little pieces. You see the sheaves that are, you remember the song we used to sing, bringing in the sheaves? Yeah. And uh, that's an insult to people today to be called a sheave, so we don't, I'm just joking. 
So at any rate, you have sheaves that are ready there, and uh, they do tie those up. I have a, another picture perhaps I can show you that uh, is of people gathering the sheaves, having them tied up just like you'd have to do, and then taking those into where the work will be done. And a lot of that work in the field is done by women, but not all of it. And uh, you remember the text that we have in the New Testament showing that it is proper, Paul uses this twice, once for preachers and once for elders, that it is possible that you support those people who devote their full time to these efforts. You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. And that's an illustration to say that if somebody works, they should be paid for what they do if that's needed. And so that's what was being done here in, in Egypt. And this is the threshing sledge. I have lots of pictures of threshing sledges. We see them uh, in display mostly. We don't see them in use as much in Israel as you would in the isolated places like the one in Egypt and the one in Lebanon. But uh, there's one that is a, a good illustration of that. And that's at Katsrin. It can be spelled with a Q-R-K. Anything that's got C in it, our letter C, will probably be, be like a, a K, could be a Q, and spelled that way. So this place is, is Katsrin. And it is in Galilee. It is north of the Sea of Galilee. And there is at that place, instead of the first century, like Nazareth village I talked about, at Katsrin there is a Byzantine site about 500 A.D. And there they have the life of people. The village is still there. Some of the buildings are still there. There's a synagogue from that period of time. And also they have things like this that would illustrate uh, the life of the times. So it was the same as Bible time and as some places even today. Uh, at the top also, what do you see? The top of this threshing sledge. It's a yoke, exactly. And you see it's just made out of wood and uh, it reminds us of the illustration of Jesus. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So you can have the idea. It has to be well fitting is the idea. It has to fit properly. Otherwise, what's going to happen to the animal? It's going to rub their backs. It's going to rub their necks, and it's going to hurt, and they won't be able to work tomorrow. So you have to treat them properly. And that's the illustration of what we have. And here is beside this one in Aphrodisias, Turkey. Aphrodisias is not named in the Bible, but it is near, uh, fairly near, uh, Colossae and Laodicea and maybe a hundred miles or so, a little less than that from Ephesus. And so you have a threshing sledge and then standing beside it you have a winnowing fork. You see how that has lots of space for the grain to go through there. All right, now here's a winnowing fork also. I mean, uh, yes, a winnowing fork on this one and the threshing sledge. Did I change pictures? No. All right, so we'll do that. And this is a close-up of that, and see what you have on one side? What do they have in there? Rock, yeah. Just little chisels of rock that are sharp. And you, you have rock that you can chisel. See, they don't make arrows anymore, but what do they do? Uh, these aren't used commonly now, but there's still a lot of them around is the point that I'm making that you can easily find these. And uh, they've got the rock in them. And when that rock goes over, there you go, look at that one. Would you like to be threshed? I don't think so. It's not very pleasant. When my grandmother, you know, when I didn't mind, you know what she did? And what, what did she give me a threshing with? 
a switch like that? No. From a what? Well, actually, she used a peach tree. And which one did I get when I'd go out? The smallest one. And what did I not know? It hurts the worst. <laughs> so, see, I turned out okay. Well, this is, of course, very important, isn't it? Because this is something that is used in the Bible throughout, both literally of what we're talking about and figuratively. And we'll come to that in a minute or two. So put those big pieces of rock, and there are not so many pieces left in some of these older ones, but you can see this is the whole process here. Did I go backwards again? No, going forward. And so you have uh, all the, what you see here. This is at Memphis in Egypt, near the, not very far from the Great Pyramids. And uh, you see he's got his donkey there that he has ridden in. And now he seems to be working. Maybe he's used the donkey. Maybe he's used uh, other animals. And you can see where they've been going around and around and around. And so now he's working on part of that. And do you see? See, see it going up in the air? See, he's throwing it up like that. And the wind is catching that and blowing some of that away. So this is exactly what is talked about in Scripture. And I got this wonderful slide years and years ago at uh, Shechem. And you just, sometimes you happen on these things, you know, you don't, you don't know it's going to be there that day, but you're hoping for something like that. And so they have this grain all piled together. There are bigger piles that are not yet, not yet uh, been run over with the threshing sledge. And now uh, one man and two women are, she seem, he seems to be working at it right now. They're waiting perhaps for a minute till he gets his little job done. And you can see that the wind is catching that. See, and I may have another picture that may be the only one and not another one that would show that. And these are the winnowing forks. It says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 12 that John the Baptist, when he introduced Jesus, he said that his threshing, his winnowing fork rather, is in his hand. His winnowing fork is in his hand. Jesus was going to separate the good from the bad. He used a lot of illustrations. He used the sheep and the goats and the judgment. And he used here also the idea of the winnowing fork being in his hand to separate those people who would accept the teachings of the kingdom and those that would not. And uh, so, again, the bigger picture from Aphrodisias. And uh, then there's another illustration in uh, the uh, book of Luke 22:31, where the Lord said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Did you realize the Lord sifts us? We get sifted perhaps day by day, month by month, year by year. And uh, the, pro the, the question is, how do we turn out You know, after all of the sifting that takes place? And so this is what is used. Same thing we would use for sifting anything today. And this gentleman is holding this one. It, it will take the smaller things will fall through. You'd, you would use different, kind, different sizes of these. In other words, different, the, the screen is going to be different sizes. So that you would have larger pieces that will fall through. And then little by little, you know, you get it down to the grain that is good. Uh, that will be there. Uh, you throw away these rock that you're catching and anything else that is not what should be there. Uh, archaeologists use this method. Uh, they sift the soil. This is a fairly new thing in archaeology, going back 30 or 40 years probably, that they sift 
the soil that they dig up in order to be sure to find even the smallest things like jewels and small pieces of items that are significant, that are important. And this was at Mount Sinai. This uh, gentleman said that all of these things that he is showing here, uh, and you're not seeing all those in his sifter, you're seeing through the sifter to the floor. And he said that all of these belong to his grandfather, meaning what? I don't still use these. I make money off the tourist. <laughs> but my grandfather used to use these tools. And the, one of the tools that he used was the sifting. And that's what we read about in the scripture. Now, back to another one of these places, lower left corner, Neot Kedumim is a wonderful place to visit to see a lot of the customs. And they have a threshing floor there that is actually stone. This is a big stone that is here. It's stone, a lot of stone in the area. And you can see not in such good condition right now as some of the ones I've shown you, but they still have here this, this uh, item right there. See, that's the threshing sledge. And so with the animals pulling that over and over and over on that rock, that's going to do a pretty good job. Maybe less dirt in your flower uh, than if you had the other one that's just on earth. But you'll see a lot of them that are just, just on earth, and uh, they keep going around and around on those things. And so in Isaiah 21 and verse 10, the Bible says, Oh, my threshed people, Israel had been threshed. They're going to be because Babylon and the other countries, the Assyrians and the Babylons are coming in and it's going to be bad. Oh, my threshed people and my afflicted of the threshing floor. Can't you just hear this, make a, make a good commercial out of that? I mean, here's the wheat down on the ground. The wheat says, oh, please, don't come over me again. And then here he comes. <laughs> and then again and again and again. And it just keeps, keeps going. I wish that would stop. And it just keeps going. And that's exactly the way Israel felt. Do you realize that the Assyrians were in the country from, 10, from 935 at Hazor, they were still there at 9.22 and 21 at Samaria, making our way south. And they're there at, what is it, the year uh, 910 at least, when they take Lachish and they try to take Jerusalem. Think about that. Think how many cattle they ate. Think how many bushels of grain they ate per day. Think how many fruit trees just one regiment could take care of all the right fruit. You see what the Lord did to his people? His people were being threshed. That's the illustration that is used in a lot of these biblical references. Here's another one in Isaiah 27:12. It says the Lord will start his threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt. Now, I identified the brook of Egypt. Some of you would know this if you had freshman Bible, Old Testament, that it is the Wadi El Arish. It's not the Nile River. The Wadi El Arish is the boundary of the promised land on the south at the coast, the coast of the Mediterranean. It is just south, the southern portion of what we call the Gaza Strip today. And so there's a little stream, Wadi. Wadi means it doesn't run all the time. It's a dry creek bed. And when it rains, when they do have rain there, there's not so much, you know, but when it does, that water flows through that. Elah is a brook the same way. It's a brook. It's not a river. It's just something that runs when, when after there has been rain. And uh, so you will go from the Euphrates, which is 
now at the border with Syria and Turkey, runs of course on through, through Iraq, and when you go from there, it will go all the way to your southern border. So what does that cover? It covers the entirety of the land that God promised to his people Israel. I'm going to give you this land, but if you don't obey me, what's going to happen? You're going to be threshed. So he told them the same thing that we talk about when we say, you're going to get a good spanking. It, and Well, it's worse than that, because I'm sure none of us would kill our kids. <laughs> so this is the Euphrates. Look at that big river. It is a big river. The Jordan was nothing compared to that. You could lay the Jordan in there 20 times across that, maybe more. And that's just one place. I've seen the uh, Euphrates several places. And this place up in Turkey uh, is a very good illustration of how large it is. And he says from that. Now, I didn't look up the references on this, but you will find, if you will take your concordance, uh, you know, do it like this. And you take your concordance and you check it, and you will find that the Lord told them many times that I'm going to dry up the river. What did he mean when he said, I'm going to dry up the river? And the armies will come what? They'll come across on dry land. Was that literal? No, no, no. What do you mean when he said we're going to dry up the river? It meant just one thing. It meant war. It meant the battle is coming. It meant somebody's going to come in here and they're going to eat you up. They're going to come in here and they're going to run all over you. This is the way the Lord warned his people to tell them that the Euphrates would be dried up and these enemies. So who was on the other side of the river? Assyria, number one. Number two, Babylon. And so they had that in two separate times. The, those great enemies that came after them at that there. Now, he made a point in Isaiah 28, verse 27, when he says, For dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge. Dill is something small, like comes off of a little plant of some sort you'd have in your garden. And so it's not with a threshing sledge, nor is the cartwheel driven over coming. You tithe what? Mint, anise, and cumin. Little bitty things. He, he was complimenting the people in a way, but then he was getting after them. You, 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 you will you'll tithe these things. Can't you just say, <laughs> say us getting salt out? The Lord wants us to tithe, and so we get our salt out and, or try it. confectionary sugar. <laughs> and we've got our microscope down there, and we say, okay, one for the Lord nine for me. Imagine that. And that's exactly the sort of thing he's saying here. He said, but you do not run a threshing sledge over common. The cartwheel isn't driven over common. Or, uh, that was over dill. And he said, uh, dill is beaten out with a rod and common with a club. So another method was used that wasn't nearly as severe but it did the job. And that's the way the Lord would bring his judgment upon the people. In chapter 45, verse 15, Behold, I have made you a new sharp, I have made you a new sharp threshing sledge with double edges. Whoa, that's bad. You will thresh the mountains and pulverize them and will make the hills like chaff. Now he's telling Israel 
that the time will come that you will be successful again if you return to me and you will be threshing the enemy. See, and that's what is early as Deuteronomy, isn't that what the Lord tells them? If you obey me, you'll have these blessings. If you disobey me, you'll have these what? Curses. The curses will come upon you. And so he's telling them the way it's going to be using the illustration of the threshing sledge. Does that make these texts more understandable now? I think it does, doesn't it? It does for me. And in Isaiah 41, 16, you will winnow them, the enemy, and the wind will carry them away, and the storm will scatter them, but you will rejoice in the Lord. You will glory in the Holy One of Israel. You'll be steady. You'll be here. You'll be again in Zion. And all these enemies will be gone. And so that's the nature of his kingdom. And even looking forward to the kingdom that we're in today. Because the fact that we know the nature of the kingdom is not one that is a kingdom of men that will pass away. Like Daniel 2 talks about. So here's John's announcement of the ministry of Jesus. He says in chapter 3 and verse 11, As for me, I baptize you, that's somebody else's water. We have good people around here. I baptize you with water for repentance, said John. But you will, you, uh, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So he's talking about Jesus, isn't he? As he announces the coming of Jesus. And so now we see his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will thoroughly cleanse the threshing floor, his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn. I'll try to talk about the barn. It's a silo. That's what it is. It's dug in the ground. It's not like we think the barn. The kids played in the barn when I was a kid. And we would have done that back then too. You know, but it's a silo that's in the ground. And so he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Got to get rid of that stuff. And so you burn it. And it's all gone. It's not good for anything. Oh, it might help you start a fire, but not even like kindling would do. I wanted to tell you a story. This is one picture I missed but I I remember it it's in my mind just as clearly as it was I think it was 1981 and I was uh, driving across the area where Gibeon is going from the central mountain range down to the coast I was alone. I was going to Egypt, I mean to Israel, to work on at Lakish. And my colleagues had never been to Cairo, to Egypt, so they went there. Bill Roberts, Harold Tabor, Jim Hodgson. They're all gone today. Only I remain. And I had been in Galilee for a couple of days and I was going to meet them at the airport. Then from there, we were going to take a flight to, uh, we were going to, to Lakeish. They were coming in. Well, their flight, I got there and their flight was delayed by 24 hours. No flights today, tomorrow. So, you know, I go back, find a place to stay, go back tomorrow. And we spent a few days there in Jerusalem after they got there, and so on. So I'm driving along that place. 
And you say, why well, I remember this? But those three guys, good friends, who've passed on now. How many of you had one of those for a teacher? Bill Roberts, look at it. There was a woman over here. There was a threshing floor. But I was watching my road, and by the time I saw it, it was too late. She had taken, you know, they would cut the sheaves about like this. They cut the grain. It depends on the height of the grain, of course. But some of them are like this. And she had taken one of these and then tied it. And what has she made for herself? Hmm? She's got a handle, but she's got a handle on the top of it and what's she going to do with it? She's made a broom out of it. And you know what she was doing? She was at the edge of the threshing floor. She was saving every piece of grain there was. That's what it means. He will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. Because the good he gathers into the barn. And that that is not, he does what? It's blown away. It's used for fire. It's nothing. And so that is the difference in the two. Well, isn't that fascinating to see this? One illustration and how much there is in the Bible that tells us about this. Let's see where I am and then we've got just a few minutes to go. We're going to talk a little bit about plants of Palestine. I hadn't even moved my notes here. I guess I should do that. So we'll get down to, to the right thing. There's flax, combed flax. And this is from Egypt in the British Museum. Another illustration. Remember that the flax and the barley were damaged in the seventh plague when hail hit the country. And then we have also an illustration of Rahab at uh, that she hid the spies in the stalks of flax on her roof. So they were growing flax. And what is it used for? Well, it's used for making cloth. And it was a very fine product, of course. And so here's a linen garment from Egypt from 1350 B.C., it says. And it's in the British Museum now. This one is. There was also, uh, could be used for food. The seed of it could be. It could be used as the wick for lamps. The little lamps that would be carried around in the house and put on a little stand of some sort. And it was fiber for linen. Joseph was clothed in fine linen. That indicates what? It is for the wealthy, those who are honored, and the priest also wore linen garments, especially his underwear, undergarments, but perhaps some of the other as well. And uh, so with all of that in mind, that's a use of the flax. The big three grain, we talked about this before. Remember it was going to be the grain, the new wine, and the oil. So we'll pick up right there Lord willing, when's the next class? Did you find out the answer to my question? Coming, all right. I was wondering if we'd have a class when we have the gospel meeting in the spring, if that would go through Sunday night. Look forward to seeing all of you on Wednesday, Lord willing.